That's right, I brought this Pokemon myth to life. Now, I'm sure you've seen plenty of other versions of this event, or others like it done via ROM hacks or game mods or something. But what's so special about this is that it's done on an unmodified copy of Ruby using nothing but the Nintendo e-reader, two GBAs, and a link cable. Instead of ROM hacking Pokemon Ruby, I'm ROM hacking the Eon Ticket, a card you swipe into the e-reader to get the event to go to Southern Island. I've already modified it a ton before in my videos about making DLC for Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire and localizing the Eon Ticket to every language, so you can learn more about how it works in those videos. But I know what you're thinking. Blissey, how is this any different from the Celebi you've already done? Well, hold on to your butts because this is going to be a wild ride, and let me show you the goals I had for this Jirachi. There were three main things I wanted to do with this Jirachi. One, I wanted it in Moss Deep, either attached to the White Rock or to the Space Center. Two, I wanted to make sure that it was a battle, because I don't think there's ever been a Jirachi battle where you can catch it. And three, I wanted it to be fully legal, so it could transfer all the way up to modern Pokemon games where it's available. Let's start where I put it, which is the White Rock. So in the Gen 3 GBA games, most things that happen to you are coded in what's called a script. In the base game, this could be tied to almost anything, signs, NPCs, and even just X and Y coordinates on the map. And already we've hit our first snag. You see, the Eon ticket, when it sends itself over, can actually only assign itself to NPCs. It can't use X and Y coordinates, and it can't use signposts. And the White Rock? It's a signpost, not an NPC. This was especially frustrating because so many things are NPCs in this game. Pokeballs, cut trees, rock smash rocks, and more. They're all NPCs. Why would this rock not be one? So I decided to pivot to someone in the space center. I thought I could use one of Ruby's script commands that teleport you to another location to send you to the moon and start a battle. After some minor testing, teleporting you out of bounds in Meteor Falls looks very convincing as the surface of the moon. But again, we hit another problem almost immediately. Every single teleport command in Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Fire Red, and Leaf Green terminates script execution. So I cannot teleport somewhere, do a battle, and then teleport away. I just teleport, and then I get stuck, and no battle happens. Great. <laughs> it seemed I was at two different dead ends. The white rock was not usable, and I couldn't teleport to the moon. So was there any hope? Well, while I was looking at the script commands, I found one called Apply Movement. This command lets you move either an NPC or the player character based on bytes found at a specific location in RAM. With just a little bit of creativity, this would let me use the white rock. It took a little bit of work to get this command to function, but eventually I figured it out with the help of my friend Riley, and I made a prototype event in the game scripting language, so let's take a look at what I came up with. First, I have the girl next to the rock ask you if she wants a wish. If you say no, the event ends. Otherwise, it continues to the next part of the code. Here, the girl says she'll let you make a wish privately, and then checks your X and Y coordinates using the command get player position. This writes your X and Y coords into some of the game's predefined variable locations. I then compare the X coordinate to 37, which is the X coordinate of the tile to the left of the woman. Then, based on which tile you're on, the script jumps to one of two different movement paths for you to move. Then, I move her out of the way using apply movement, and after that, I move the player into position next to the rock, where I have a small cutscene of Jirachi appearing. Then, I use Set Wild Battle to put a level 5 Jirachi in enemy RAM, play its cry, and start the battle. Keep in mind that this is just a prototype of the event. The whole thing is cool, but the Jirachi it produces isn't legal. That's going to require a lot more custom code. So, with that said, let's talk about the challenges of making a legal Jirachi. The first thing I have to do is pick which Jirachi I want to replicate. Most people would think I would want to produce a Wishmaker Jirachi from the US Coliseum bonus disc, because it's by far the most well-known Jirachi event that there is. But this Jirachi has a secret, and that is, it's really boring. <laughs> you see, normally a static gift Pokemon can have 4.2 billion different seeds it generates from. This is, as you might have guessed, a lot, and means that most people who receive a Pokemon would get a different one. But Wishmaker actually only has 65,535 seeds it can generate from. This is not a lot, and for Shiny Hunters it means two things. One, this Jirachi is actually not full odds, it's like 1 out of 7k, making it the only method hunt in Gen 3. Uh, also, since Wishmaker has a set trainer ID and secret ID, the same 9 Jirachi are shiny every time. It doesn't change like it would with a normal Pokémon. 
This means that every shiny is a clone that someone else has caught before. Less of a big deal, but I think this makes the gift a bit less interesting from my perspective anyway. On top of this, every single one of these Jirachis has a completely garbage stat spread for competitive play. Not a single one of the 65,535 has a good stat spread and nature combo. It's actually insane. The solution here is to use the gift Jirachi from Pokemon Channel. For those who don't know, Europe and Australia didn't get the Pokemon Coliseum bonus disc for Wishmaker Jirachi. Instead, the PAL version of Pokemon Channel distributes a Jirachi for them. This Jirachi has a different trainer ID, trainer name, and generation method than Wishmaker. It has the standard amount of spreads you would expect, and it's also not shiny locked. So there's over 100,000 shinies available to players at Gen 3's full odds. In addition, there's plenty of good competitive Jirachi spreads available here. I've even RNG'd a few myself, so this was obviously the way to go. So what's the catch? Well, not only does it generate differently than a normal GBA Pokemon, but Channel Jirachi's generation method is weird. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Plissy, we've been here before. Your Celebi also used a different generation method compared to the GBA games. Just reuse the code from that. Well, unfortunately for me, Channel Jirachi uses an entirely different generation method than a Ghetto Celebi. But why can't I reuse the non-RNG logic? Stuff like transferring to enemy RAM, encrypting, etc. It's because the Channel Jirachi RNG algorithm is so long that I'd run out of space if I reuse the Celebi code I made. I only have 995 bytes. That's not even a kilobyte to program all of this in. This includes the text, the scripting language, and my custom assembly code. Because Jirachi's RNG algorithm is so much more complicated than anything that I had done before, I needed a lot of help from my friend Xiao to make this work. The first thing we did was take a look at PokeFinder's source code. This is a Pokemon RNG simulator, and it helped us to understand how Channel Jirachi's RNG sequence worked. Then, Xiao wrote a version of that in C, which I then converted to GBA Thumb Assembly. Assembly code is kind of awful to look at and read, but it's pretty much a requirement when you're working with such tight space constraints. It's the only way to ensure that the code is as efficient as possible. This is why I use GBA Thumb Assembly over GBA's ARM Assembly. Thumb commands are 16 bits, and while they're less expressive than ARM, ARM commands are always 32 bits, no matter how simple the command you need to do is. If we had to use that, we'd probably never have had enough space to make any of these custom events in the first place. And one of the main reasons assembly code can be so frustrating to work with is that it doesn't really have a lot of operations that it can perform compared to a modern programming language. When it comes down to it, thumb assembly can do operations with eight spots in the GBA CPUs, known as registers, and pretty much all you can do is load or store values to and from RAM into them, and then do math to the values that's contained in the registers. That's it. Okay, enough about what kind of code I used. Let's talk about what I actually wrote. I'll also have an example of Pokemon Channel side by side here, so you can see what the thumb code is actually replicating. So the way receiving a Jirachi in Pokemon Channel works is that you load up the game, and then it pulls an initial seed from somewhere in the GameCube's RAM. This can be any 32-bit number, which is between 0 and FFFF, FFFF. So the first thing I did was pull an initial seed as well. The GBA's initial seeds are only 16-bit, but the current PRNG state is actually a 32-bit number, so I use that instead. So after channel has the initial seed, the game loads the main menu. And when it does that, the four menu options here of new game, options, continue, and special are loaded in a random order. Jirachi is in the options menu from the main menu. This means that every time we want to receive a Jirachi, we must necessarily go through the main menu and consequently the RNG advancements that it does to determine the menu's order. So that's the first thing my code is doing after getting the initial seed. An RNG advance in this context is taking the current seed, multiplying it by 343FD, and then adding 269EC3 to it. So I load these values into some registers and then do the maths to the RNG state, which is in register zero. The code to handle the menu order is a bit complex, but it loops the RNG advancement over and over until a location for each of the menu options is chosen. Obviously, I'm not actually placing a menu somewhere, but I have to simulate that. Once that's done, the game does a few more RNG advances. It's kind of weird. So the game does four RNG advances, then it does some math to determine if it should do three or four extra advances in addition to that. My best guess is it's doing some particle effects for when Jirachi shows up, but I don't really see any visual differences each time I load it. Very weird, but whatever, I implement it. Once those advancements are done, it's actually time to start building the Jirachi. And the way Channel Jirachi does this is also pretty unique. 
First, it does an RNG advance to determine Jirachi's secret ID, because that's random, unlike Celebi or Wishmaker Jirachi. After the secret ID is determined, it does two RNG advancements for the PID. First for the upper half of it, and then one for the lower. Once the personality value and the secret ID are loaded in, the game loads in Jirachi's trainer ID as well and attempts a shiny lock. This shiny lock actually fails every time because the developer who programmed it forgot how the order of operations works in C. I'll give you a moment to pause and figure out why this is wrong. The reason this fails is because the less than eight check actually has a priority over than the bitwise exclusive or operator in C. The less than is a true or false check, which when read as a number becomes a one for true or a zero for false. Then the rest of the operation completes as TID exclusive or secret ID, exclusive or PID high, and then exclusive or zero or one, depending on how that true or false thing ended up. After the equation is completed, you're left with an if statement trying to interpret a number as true or false. And the way C does that is by treating a zero as false and everything else is true. So almost every time Jirachi is generated, the PID is modified for literally no reason. And roughly the rarity of a square shiny in Sword and Shield, that's the amount of time the PID won't be modified in the instance that the entire operation results in a zero. At this point, we have to do a few more RNG calls. One to determine Jirachi's berry, one to determine the game origin, whether it's from Ruby or Sapphire. Yes, it determines that randomly instead of the games for some reason. Uh, one to determine the player gender. Again, it doesn't use your gender, it just picks one. And then you have to do six more after that, one for each of the IVs. At this point, we've got an entire Jirachi built. Now, this was kind of the same as Celebi up until this point, except that Jirachi was 260 bytes long, whereas Ageto Celebi's RNG algorithm was only 92. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, cool, 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 cool. We've already maybe lost just a smidge of space. I think a smidge of space we've lost here. Um, and I really don't think there's much more I could have done to compress this algorithm down. So that's quite a loss. <laughs> No matter how much I cut down my event and script text, which are by far the biggest space wasters, there's no way I can make it within a thousand bytes. This means I'm gonna have to rework a lot of the Celebi code I already had. So let's go over how I saved space in GBA thumb assembly. Because memory is gonna be so tight, what I did was delete my entire planned event script for the most part, so I could properly route out my ASM code to see how much room I'd have left afterwards to fit the you know, flourishes and events and movement paths and things like that. So including the RNG algorithm I already wrote, here's everything I need to put into RAM script. I need to store a fake Jirachi there. I need to copy Jirachi to enemy RAM. I need to fix Jirachi's substructure order. I need to fix Jirachi's checksum. I need to encrypt Jirachi. I need to calculate its stats, and then I need to handle capturing it. The only thing on this list that has no chance of being shrunken down is the temporary Jirachi that we must store in RAM. This is an 80 byte box mon, so that's another 80 bytes off the list that we can't fix at all. Hilariously though, storing the Jirachi did lead me to an organization fixed. So it's time for a little tangent. If you recall from my last video, the way I stored all my custom assembly in the code was by using these macros, which repeatedly define a single byte over and over. This worked well, but was miserable to read, edit, and debug. I mean, seriously, look at it. But one night after having wrapped up on some of the work for this Jirachi, I had an epiphany while showering. This macro system supports defining a single byte, yes, but it also supports defining words and defining double words, which are two and four bytes respectively. All thumb code commands are two bytes, and all the info I need to store, be it the Jirachi or a location in RAM, well, they're four bytes long. So instead of looking like this, the raw byte code looks like this. You may think this is still terrible, but this is so much more readable to me that debugging and troubleshooting easily went twice as fast because I could actually tell what was where and what was what just at an easy glance. I guess the point of this tangent is, do not doubt the power of readable and organized code because it can make your life way easier. Maybe I learned that a little bit too late as someone who isn't a programmer for their job. <laughs> um, okay, tangent over.
Okay, so let's look at how we optimized copying Jirachi to enemy RAM and fixing the substructure because I did both of these things at once. So the first memory copy is largely the same as Celebi was where I copy from the start of the PID to the start of the substructures in enemy RAM. Now, because the PID has changed, the order of my substructures has likely changed and I need to copy them over in the correct order. With Celebi, I had four tables that were 24 bytes long, each defining where a substructure should go. This wastes a lot of space that I don't have anymore, and Xiao came up with a way to encode the substructure position into one 24 byte long table. This saves a whopping 72 bytes. What we ended up doing was, in one byte, encoding the substructure order for the PID type with two bits in the byte. Since our original PID is the GAEM order, we use the lowest two bits to determine where G goes, copy that over to enemy RAM, and bit shift the byte to the right by two. So now the lowest two bits contain A's position, and we rinse and repeat until all four substructures are copied into enemy RAM. Okay, so now that we have the entire Jirachi in enemy RAM, we have to fix the checksum, encrypt it, and calculate its stats. The first optimization here was fixing the checksum. Last time we did this math ourselves by adding all the half words of the substructures together, the problem though is that changing the SID like we did makes calculating the checksum a lot more complicated than it used to be. Beforehand, I was under the impression that the calculate box mon checksum function didn't store the result of that operation anywhere. And that's partially true. It doesn't save the result to RAM or anything like that. But after some tracing work, I found that it does just leave the result in register zero until the game needs the register for something else. Now that I know this, I can just write a program that calls that function for me and make sure that I preserve my last return point so register zero does not get overwritten. And I can write the checksum value to enemy RAM myself after it comes back. This makes the code even shorter than it was for my Celebi because the game is doing all of the work for me. Once that is done, I use the same technique to encrypt the Jirachi as well as load in its stats. Now we've got a fully legal Jirachi ready to battle in enemy RAM. Yep. Boom! <laughs> that feels good <laughs> that feels very good i only got one thing wrong my last major optimization was how i did my information storage i have to keep things like the colo and xd rng multipliers the location of the prng state the location of my temporary jirachi and all of the in-game functions somewhere in ram script beforehand every time i did a custom asm call i'd store all that info in that specific program directly after it and i did that every single time this was a huge waste of space especially because tons of the info was the same thing repeated many times over in celebi's code for example you can see i store its location multiple times its tid multiple times and enemy ram multiple times here i minimized repeat info as much as possible and i only had three storage areas so here's the order of the program. First came channels RNG algorithm, and then directly after that was a storage table for all the info I would need during said algorithm. After that storage table, I had the temporary Jirachi because I could pull the TID directly from it during the RNG algorithm instead of storing the TID elsewhere. Then for the memory copy and fix stuff, I had them use one storage table, which contained all the values they would need. Since every single native function would be using the same location for Jirachi, enemy RAM, I didn't need to load it multiple times. I had to do a lot more planning and debugging to figure out what value to add to the point counter every time, but it was so worth it to save space like this. Realistically, if I looked, I probably could have compressed this even more than what I did, and I know for sure I didn't write the most space efficient code of all time, but I'm pretty happy with the results of it. Now, at this point, I don't have any more optimizations to do, but I do have a bug fix from Celebi. You see, in my Celebi event, you can't nickname the Celebi because of how I handle the capturing. I require you to have an empty party slot for this event and the Celebi event because catching a Pokemon with a different trainer ID than yours will turn it into a bad egg because the encryption key is changing. So how I did it then was before the battle starts, I copy the Pokemon from enemy RAM back over the temp one we originally had. Then after the battle, I check if the amount of party Pokemon you have has changed. And if it has, I copy that one over the bad egg that's in your party before you have time to access it and see that it's a bad egg. This works pretty well, but because the Celebi's data is from before the battle, it doesn't have a nickname. I fix this for Jirachi pretty easily by just doing two copies after the battle instead. First, I let the game copy over the 100 by Pokemon to your party, which bad eggs. Then I do a mem copy from PID to OTID. After that, I do another mem copy from after the nickname to the rest of the Pokemon until the substructures end. This lets the game copy over the nickname as well as the stats over naturally, and my brute force hacky solution copies the rest over. 
The remaining PP is still bugged and will still be at maximum values. I could have fixed this, but I think it wasn't worth it for the amount of space and RAM it would have taken up. At this point, we have a fully legal Jirachi capturable. And if we check the remaining space that we have, it's 180 bytes. Now, this is not a lot, but it is doable. The biggest space waster by far is text, so I have to keep that concise. But there are some script code optimizations I can make as well. The main thing I did was remove a bunch of if statements. Let's take a look at a small example, comparing my original example script I showed you earlier to the final one that I've developed. If we take a look at check spot, in the original, I have two if statements. One goes to movement one if you're in one spot, and the other goes to movement two if you're in the other. But in the updated script, I realized we only needed one if statement. I just placed movement one directly after check spot, so that if the if statement doesn't go to movement two, it naturally moves down to movement one. Then I also realized that movement one, where you stand to the left of the girl, only has two additional movements compared to movement two. So instead of making it two entirely different movement paths, movement one just does the two extra movements and then the game naturally moves to movement path two before finishing everything up. I apply this type of optimization all over the script as much as possible. And when all was said and done, I had just three bytes remaining. So yeah, it was a little bit tight. But with it done, let's take a look at the event in full. So the girl asks you if you have a wish, and if you say no, she is surprised and thought that everybody had a wish. If you say yes, she tells you to leave a wish tag on the white rock. Then the player walks to the white rock, and while writing your wish, the rock breaks open and you're surprised to see a Pokemon. Jirachi makes its cry and the battle initiates. You may be surprised to see that Jirachi is level 50 in the battle, and yet channel Jirachi's encounter level is supposed to be 5. How is this legal? Well, I actually came to a realization while working on the Jirachi, and that's that Met level is coded into its miscellaneous substructure, and the way that I put it into your party does not change that. This means I can make the current level, aka what level it is when you battle it, whatever I want. And so I thought level 50 would be more appropriate for the 7th gym. It's a little bit higher than Tate and Liza, but I think it's still fine. In addition, I wanted this battle to be a challenge if you're not just going to catch it with a Master Ball. So Jirachi comes with a pretty good moveset of Psychic, Fire Punch, Calm Mind, and Wish. Fire Punch is also exclusive to the Emerald Move Tutor, so I save you some BP and give you an event move for this Jirachi. And I think that's it. The only other oddities to note about Jirachi are the same things that Celebi had that were weird. The Pokeball will always be a Pokeball when caught, not whatever you use to catch it. This is to keep the event legal. Uh, I already mentioned the PP remainder thing, and game origin and trainer gender likely won't match your own. Uh, this is because the Jirachi randomizes it itself, so. Uh, but I think that's it. Oh, actually, there is one more thing. So if you nickname this Jirachi and then you check in PK Hex, PK Hex will actually tell you it's illegal because of the nickname. This is untrue, and the Jirachi is totally legal. However, the odds of you soft resetting for a trainer ID, secret ID combo that's an exact match for any event is very low. And while it is possible to RNG manip such a combo, the PK Hex devs thought it would be better to flag this as illegal to prevent people from being tricked by bad hacks. So don't think you did anything wrong by nicknaming it, it's just user protection on PK Hex's end for the less informed. In addition, I didn't program anything wrong either, so there's no worry with that. Alright, with the showcase done, let's talk about how to get this into your- Hold it! The number one question I got asked in my last DLC video was, is this only for English games? And yeah, at the time, the events were. But because so many of you asked, here you are. I programmed all of my events in every single Gen 3 language. Jirachi is already available, you could go download it right now in any language, and I already finished Celebi as well. The other events I'm slowly chipping away at, but I view them as less important since they're just recreations of Emerald events that you can easily get to with glitches in that game. This means the only e-card support for EU Pokemon games is from me, and so I'll go over the quick details on how this works for all of my EU viewers. For the EU games, you'll need a United States or Australian e-reader, and for the Japanese games, you'll need an e-card reader plus. In addition, for the text on the EU games, the e-reader does not have many of the special characters required, so the text may look a little bit funky. We did the best with what we had, though. If you want to find out more about how I got the e-reader to communicate with all these European games, check out my video on localizing the Eon ticket, I went into detail there. As for making my events work in other languages, the main thing I had to do was find different RAM addresses. 
So the first things I went after were the uh, locations for the functions like encrypt boxmon. The way I found those was by going into MGBA and copying the raw byte code from the English game and then searching for it using RAM search in a different language. And then I would just pick the area that was most similar until I found the function. Uh, it was just tedious, kind of boring work, but eventually I found them all in every single language. The party location, enemy RAM location, and PRNG state location were just documented by other people who have done emulator RNG before, so I just took those from some Lua scripts. And then for RAM script and the variables, those actually don't change in the EU games, but they do change in the Japanese games. And hilariously, I was able to find it uh, simply because uh, the game's saves are cross-compatible across all other languages. So all I had to do was load my event up into an English game and then load that save in a Japanese game and look for my bytecode and eventually I found the proper location uh, in Japanese. Uh, and once that was done, we had everything working uh, you know, script-wise in the languages, even if in some instances the text was a little bit goobed up. But that's where my translators came in. After all the code was changed and the events are running on all of these languages, I reached out to people in my community and got a bunch of native speakers of these languages to translate. So thank you to all of my translators on screen so you can all experience these events in different languages. Uh, I couldn't have done it without them. I do not speak uh, five languages. <laughs> uh, and once the text is inserted, everything looks great, I think. Okay, with everything done, we can now talk about my custom e-cards. This is my custom e-card for Jirachi. The card was designed just the same as my previous ones. I've got a bit of lore about Jirachi on the front of the card and for reasoning as to why it's in Moss Deep. On the back, I've got a picture of Moss Deep City and the Sugimori art of Jirachi. And that's pretty much everything. But before I go, I wanna do a few quick FAQs I get about these events all the time. So the first one is, can I put more than one event in my game at a time? No. RAM script can only hold one event per save, so just do them one at a time. Can I do these events more than once? Yes. Every event other than Kyogre and Groudon can be done infinitely. This is because the way I did the check for those two was kind of lazy and I don't feel like fixing it. But everything else, there is no limits. Celebi is the only one with a shiny card. Are these Pokemon shiny locked? No, none of the events are shiny locked except for Celebi. That's actually why I gave it two cards. Because breaking the shiny lock breaks legality, so I wanted people to be sure which event they were playing. In addition, every single one of these events is full odds. Do you plan on doing any more events? As of right now, no, I'm done. That's pretty much because I can't think of anything else, so if you've got any interesting ideas, leave them down below and I'm happy to tackle it. Or take a look at my source code and make one yourself, maybe. Um, I think that's everything for now. Uh, if you intend to use this Jirachi event, tag me on Twitter or on Discord or on YouTube. I would love to see people hunting or using this event. Um, if you've got any more questions, you can leave a comment below or join my Discord and uh, go into the e-card section and I'll be happy to help you there. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next video. Bye-bye.